is Unit 8, Bonding. Getting really close to the end here. And Concept 1, we're going to talk about stability and why atoms of elements would choose to bond in the first place. And then we're going to introduce one type of bonding and then we'll kind of go from there. So let's just jump in. Let's talk about elements and combining. So most elements on the periodic table, they're not found just by themselves in nature. Of course some are, but usually they're found actually combined with other elements. And so we call that a compound. That is when two or more elements are chemically combined. And that should be a familiar term to you from our matter unit. And something really important that we emphasize in the matter unit, but I want to continually emphasize, is that the properties of a compound are very different from the properties of the elements that make up the compound. Remember, we talked about sodium and chlorine are very different from sodium chloride. So sodium is explosive and chlorine is poisonous, but when they're chemically combined, they are a new substance. They are sodium chloride, NaCl, and that's table salt. That's what you eat on a lot of food. So that's something really important to remember. So I just showed you NaCl. That's an example of a chemical formula. So now we're going to talk about what a chemical formula is. It is basically what is used to tell what elements and how many of each element are going to make up a compound. So here are some examples, and I'll just kind of break down what they mean for you, and I'll also show you a picture. So H2O, that's water. What that means is that water is a compound that contains two atoms of the element hydrogen and one atom of the element oxygen. It looks a little something like this. Another example of a compound, um, NH3, that is the chemical formula for ammonia. It is a compound of one atom of the element nitrogen and three atoms of the element hydrogen. And it looks something like this. Make sure these are little numbers for a reason. They're called subscripts. So make sure you write them that way because that matters. All right. So when we form these compounds, why would this happen? This is so important. Elements form compounds because they want to be stable. All elements want to be stable, and here's what that means. It usually means the octet rule, that which states that atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons in order to have eight electrons in their outer energy shell. That's where octet rule comes. So what that means is stability to be stable. That means your outer energy level with your valence electrons should be full and complete. So that means eight. For everybody but hydrogen and helium, they only need two because they only have that one energy level. But everyone else, in, or mainly everyone else, is looking to have eight. That's what makes them stable and complete. All right, so let's look at what that means. All right, here is a Bohr model drawing of sodium and a Bohr model drawing of chlorine. So just looking at this, look at the outer energy level of sodium. It has one valence electron. So for it to be stable, it can either lose this one, so that is, this is, becomes its outer energy level of eight, or it can gain seven. What do you think it's easier to do, lose one or gain seven? Well, it's gonna be easier to lose that one. All right, so sodium, that one valence electron, it's gonna lose that electron in order to have its outermost energy level be full and stable. All right, look at chlorine. Look at its outer energy level. It has seven valence electrons. All right, so we can either lose seven to be stable or gain one. Well, what do you think is easiest? It's going to be easier to gain one. So if it can gain one electron, its outermost energy level will be full and it will be considered stable. And so this is why the bond forms between sodium and chlorine. Sodium will naturally give up its val one valence electron to chlorine, which will gain one, to make both of them stable. So this is how that bond is forming between NaCl, between table salt. So, the question is, would elements ever not benefit from forming a compound? Well, of course, if they're already stable. And elements like the noble gases are already stable. You should have learned from our last unit on atomic structure in the periodic table that the noble gases, group 18, are non-reactive elements. And now we can understand why. They're non-reactive because their outermost energy levels are full. 
Here are some examples. Remember, helium only has one energy level, and that first one only holds two. So it is full and stable with just those two. Here you can see neon, there's its eight. Argon, there's its eight. So this is just a couple of pictures just to depict how the noble gases have that full outer energy level, which makes them already stable and very unlikely to form a compound. Because if they're going to form a compound, they will become less stable, and that's very unlikely to occur. Now, let's talk more about these bonds. So chemical bonds are formed when atoms gain, lose, or share electrons in order to become stable. So a bond is formed. When that sodium gives up its one valence electron of chlorine, a bond is formed between sodium and chlorine. So the formal definition is a chemical bond is a force that holds atoms together in a substance. And there are lots of types of bonds that can form. We'll learn about some this year, we'll learn about some in biology, but we're just going to start for now looking at ionic bonds. And we'll talk about another type a little bit later in this unit, but for now we're going to start with ionic bonds. So this is a, the type of chemical bond that occurs when atoms will transfer electrons in order to be stable. So it's usually happening between a metal, like sodium, that's going to give up electrons, and a non-metal, like chlorine, that's going to gain electrons. So there's a transfer. Remember the picture of the arrow from the sodium to the chlorine. And so when this happens, this transfer happens, we get the formation of something called ions. All right, so what's an ion? Ions are atoms or molecules that have a charge due to having lost or gained electrons. So remember, generally speaking, most atoms are electrically neutral. The number of protons that they have equals the number of electrons, giving them an overall charge of zero. But think of sodium. When it loses one electron, it's gotten rid of one of its negative particles. Thus, it has one more positive than it has negative. So now it's no longer electrically neutral. It has a charge of positive one. That's what we mean by ions. And there's two types. First are cations. These are positively charged ions. And so they become positive because an atom or molecule has lost electrons. They've gotten rid of negatives. They are more positive. Metals usually form cations. They're the ones that usually get rid of their electrons. All right, so let's look at an example. All right, take magnesium. How many valence electrons does it have? Look at its outer energy level. It has two. All right, so think, is it going to gain six to be stable or lose two? Well, it's probably more likely that it will lose two. So if it loses those two E to become stable, it's going to form a cation. It's going to have a positive two charge because it now has, it had tw has 12 protons and it now only has eight plus two. It only has 10 electrons. So that's going to give you that positive two charge. And the, uh, the, for the format or the notation for ions is the symbol and then the new charge as the superscript. So it would be Mg positive two. All right. Instead, of the, other, or the opposite of cations are anions. These are negatively charged ions, and this happens when atoms or molecules gain E. They get more negative. This is usually what nonmetals do, because they're a lot closer to having an 8, so it's easier for them to gain than lose. All right, so look at oxygen. How many valence electrons does it have? Well, it has 6. All right, so because it has 6, is it going to gain 2 electrons or lose 6? Well, it's probably a lot easier if it gains 2. And when it does that, it now has two more electrons. So instead of being eight protons and eight electrons, it's eight protons and ten electrons. That will give it an overall charge of negative two. And so as an ion, it now forms an anion of O minus two. Now, together in the compound, if this magnesium gives its two to oxygen and they form a compound, MgO, magnesium oxide, overall the compound would have a neutral charge because you have the plus two of magnesium and the minus two of oxygen, that would overall give you zero. But within it, there are these ions. This is what happens in an ionic bond. All right, let's talk more about those ions, though, before I get too ahead of myself with the compounds. All right, think about lithium. What ion will it form? Okay, look at it. How many valence electrons does it have? It has one. So is it going to lose that one to be stable or gain seven? 
it's going to lose 1. When it lose one, loses 1, it's going to become less negative, meaning it's going to be more positive. So since it has a, one valence electron, it will lose it, and that will be, make a cation with a plus 1 charge. So we'd write that as Li positive 1. All right, what about nitrogen? Pause the video, think about it yourself, and then press play to hear the answer. All right, you got to look at the valence electrons. There's five valence electrons, so it's easier to gain three electrons than lose five. So it's going to gain three to get its full outer energy level and be stable. That makes an anion with a negative three charge. And so it'll be N minus three as its ion. All right, now, you may be thinking, this is really tricky. How am I supposed to remember all this? Well, luckily, there is a nice pattern. If you remember from our last unit, elements in the same group all have the same number of valence electrons. All right, so looking at my pictures at the bottom, lithium, sodium, potassium, they're all in group one. They all have one valence electron. So because of this, elements in the same group are going to form ions the same way. They're all going to act the same way. So looking again at those um, group one elements, they all have one valence electron. So all of them are going to lose one electron to be stable. So they're all going to form an ion with a positive one charge. So lithium will form Li positive 1, sodium will form Na positive 1, potassium will form K positive 1. And this charge that they all have and they all share in common as a group is called the oxidation number. So oxidation number is just my fancy word for the charge of an ion within a compound. We always write them as that superscript, um, that small kind of high up in the top right of the symbol. And again, here's our patterns. Group 1 elements have one valence electron, so they always form a plus 1 charge. Group 2 have two valence electrons, so they always form a plus 2 charge. We're going to skip groups 3 through 12 because transmission metals are a little bit tricky and they act a little bit funky. Group 13 has the three valence electrons, so they form, form a plus 3 charge. All right, group 14, they have four valence electrons, so it's just as easy for them to gain four as it is for them to lose four. So they can either have a plus four charge or a minus four charge, depending on the situation. Group 15 has five valence electrons, so it's easiest for them to gain three electrons, giving them a negative three charge. Group 16 has six valence electrons. It's a lot easier for them to gain two to get to their eight, so they have an overall negative two charge. Um, group 17 has seven valence electrons, so when they form bonds, they will gain one electron, um, so that gives them a negative one charge as anions. And then group 18, the noble gases, I didn't even write, because they have all their valence electrons, so they will never form ions naturally, because um, so, their oxidation number, if you were to give them one, would just be zero. All right, I want to teach you a new type of drawing because the Bohr models are great, and that's what I've been showing you so far because that's what you're familiar with. But it's a little complicated and uh, for what we need for understanding how compounds form. So we're going to learn a simpler drawing. Because to understand how compounds form, all we really need to understand or be able to look at and see is the valence electron. So we're going to learn a similar diagram, and this is called an electron dot diagram or a Lewis dot diagram. And it looks a little something like this, so much, much simpler. All right, so here are the steps for how to draw them. All right, so when drawing, instead of drawing the nucleus with the number of protons and neutrons and all that, you just write the atomic symbol for the nucleus. All right, so we're going to do an example as I give you the instructions. So, for instance, if I wanted the electron dot diagram of nitrogen, you would just write an N as the symbol to represent the nucleus. Then you're going to determine the number of valence electrons from the group number. So think about nitrogen. It's in group 15, so they have five valence electrons. Again, that is something you should remember from last unit. That should already be in your memory. All right, so nitrogen has five valence electrons. We're going to represent the valence electrons by drawing the amount of dots around the chemical symbol. Now, the one thing, don't let this trip you up. Always fill one at a time, one side at a time before you pair electrons up. That's just how it works structurally, so we want you to get in that habit. So, one, two, three, four. I made sure every side got one. Now I pair up five. That is the electron dot diagram to represent nitrogen, and that's a much simpler thing to look at than the Bohr model with all the energy levels and all that jazz. All right, so let's practice. I want you to pause the video and draw hydrogen, carbon, fluorine, and phosphorus. 
And then when you're done, press play and you can see to click through for the answers. All right, now, that's a great skill to have, but the reason I want you to know how to do that is so that we can use these diagrams to understand bond formation in compounds. So in order to do that, you'll draw the electron dot structures of the elements forming a bond, forming a compound, okay? Just like you just did. Then to show an ionic bond, you're gonna transfer electrons using an arrow to show that they're going from the metal to the non-metal. Because remember, metals are gonna form cations and give up electrons. Non-metals are gonna form anions and take electrons. You're gonna keep adding elements as needed. And we're doing this until all atoms are stable. This will make more sense when we do an example, I promise. And then finally, you'll write a chemical formula for the compound that will form using subscripts to show how many of each element were needed in order for both to be stable. All right, so let's do an example. All right, what compound will form between sodium and chlorine? All right, so first draw sodium. Use Na as your nucleus. It's in group one, so it has one valence electron. Now draw chlorine. Use Cl as your nucleus. It's in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons. So draw one on each side before you pair them up. All right, next we're gonna transfer electrons from the metal to the non-metal. So sodium is gonna give up its val one valence electron to chlorine. Make sure that arrow is very clear of where it's going. Now, when this happens, will sodium be stable? Yes, it'll have eight in its outer energy level. Will chlorine? Yes, it'll now have eight in its outside energy level. So now both are stable, you don't need to add any more, so we can go ahead and write the compound. The compound's chemical formula, excuse me. It took one sodium and one chlorine, so that would be Na1Cl1. Now, if there's only one needed, we don't write in the ones as subscripts, we just leave it as is, which is NaCl. All right, let's try a little bit harder example. All right, example two, what compound will form between aluminum and chlorine? All right, so first draw aluminum. Al is for the nucleus. It's in group 13, so it has three valence electrons. Chlorine, draw Cl for your nucleus, and then it's in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons. All right, so aluminum is gonna lose three as opposed to trying to gain five. So it's gonna give one of its valence electrons to chlorine. Now. Chlorine would be stable, it would have eight, but aluminum would not be. It would still have two, and that's not what it wants. It's only gonna form a compound that's beneficial to both elements. So, we're gonna need to do steps three and four. We're gonna need to keep adding elements until both are stable. So we're gonna add another chlorine so that the aluminum can give it more, get rid of more of electrons. All right, so it's gonna give another valence electron away. All right, again, both chlorines are stable, but aluminum's not. We're gonna need to add another chlorine so that it can get rid of that other valence electron. Now, aluminum's gotten rid of all three and all the chlorines are full. So this took one aluminum and three chlorines. So this will form a compound of AlCl3. All right, like before, I'm gonna give you some practice problems. I want you to pause the video. I want you to do these practice problems and then Press play so you can see if you're doing it right and check your answers. And then we'll practice in class as well. All right, and that is concept one.